All right, cool. So, started up the live video. We're gonna get the lecture started in just a minute, Facebook watchers. And I'm gonna take this off. And if it is out of anybody's comfort zone, please don't hesitate to let me know. I'd be happy to put it back on, but I'm a little bit of a mumbler, so <laughs> hopefully it'll help me enunciate having it off. Okay. Just another moment. We can go over what's on your clipboard. So Sarah probably sent most of you a packet that Shelly brought yours. Um, but in addition, so on your clipboards, there's a feedback sheet. Uh, we, we like to do these educational workshops and the feedback really helps us to, um, to make them good for the community. So I tell everybody, whatever feedback you have, uh, we love it, uh, even if it's like, I don't like the way you did your hair today. <laughs> um, whatever it is, we want you to, to be totally Long honest. Time, okay. I, I've got real thick skin, so if you have a, a, a constructive criticism, I am so happy to hear it. Uh, the next page is the follow along sheet. So um, it's gonna be, we're gonna answer these questions in the lecture. So like, you know, not mandatory, but just a nice little takeaway that you can bring home with you so that you have some stuff about it. The next sheet um, is just, a, I, uh, depending, I think they're all in the same order, is just a little testimonial sheet that we have on there. And then there is for attending the workshop today, everybody gets um, seven effective ways to ease low back pain without medication, which is just an article I wrote. Um, and then also three examples of the exercises and instructions on how to do them and for the, for the, uh, ex for the injury that we'll be talking about. What if so, you can't get down on your knees to get on the floor? We'll talk. <laughs> okay. Yes. Everything is adaptable. That's, that's definitely, uh, okay. definitely something to keep in mind. So without further ado, I think we'll go ahead and get started. All right, we'll put that there in case our fourth um, attendee shows up. Okay, well, thanks for coming out today. Uh, my name is Dr. Lauren Heinen, and I am one of the owners here. My husband, Bryce, and I own Heinen Physical Therapy, so we're all PT owned, and you know, we just kind of, we, we, we keep it very low volume, high quality therapy here, and we love to educate the community so that people know what's going on with them and what they can do on their own to take control of, of these things. So today we're talking about back pain and sciatica. So I'm sure that uh, if you guys are here, you likely have had pain in your back within the last 60 days, or you're here on behalf of somebody else who does. Um, so I want you to think in your head, telling me a little bit about it, you know, what makes your pain worse? Is it when you're sitting for a long time? Is it getting in and out of bed? Is it walking for prolonged periods? Going upstairs? Anything like that, that, that consistently makes your pain worse? Is it just all the time? Um, what makes it better? So let's say you start getting the pain when you're sitting, standing up will alleviate it. Or leaning over a cart at the grocery store instead of standing straight up. Usually there's some position that you can get your body in that's gonna make it feel better. Um, so what have you tried to alleviate it in the past? A lot of times people will come in and say, I tried injections, I tried medication, I tried going to this person and that person doing X, Y, Z, and it just didn't work out. Um, and then uh, can you pinpoint with one finger the location of where you feel like your pain starts? So sometimes the pain will be pretty local and doesn't go anywhere, but sometimes people know like, it kind of starts here and then it goes down my right leg. So back pain can be pretty specific and have a couple of little, little nuances um, that help us to determine kind of what's going on. So the only participation in today's lecture, I'm gonna have everybody go ahead and stand up for me. Oh, oh boy. That's <laughs> cool. This is the, o the only audience <laughs> participation part. So you're gonna bend down just as far as you feel comfortable going, like you're gonna touch your toes. And I want you to kind of take note of how that makes your body and your back feel. You'll slowly come up from there. That looks good, everybody. Lots of flexible people today. You're gonna place your hands on your back and you're gonna lean backwards. Okay, just kind of see if that feels high restricted, painful, maybe not 
maybe oh. maybe not something that we want to go into and then we'll do side to side so fingertips reach down your leg towards the side of your knee and then the other side kind of see if one side feels tighter or more painful than the other mm -hmm. and then rotate same thing side to side try to keep your hips facing forward as you do mm -hmm. and just rotate your trunk all right so maybe some thoughts about mm -hmm. how all of those motions make us feel you go ahead and have a seat i promise that's the only the only one i thought you were gonna have a uh, talk in there at least now <laughs> oh so, goodness like that's cool <laughs> Oh, so today we're going to talk about three major conditions related to low back pain and these are some of the, the three main ones that we typically see here in clinic. Uh, we're going to talk about the herniated disc, we're going to talk about lumbar spinal stenosis which can also be lumped in with arthritis or degenerative disc or degenerative joint disease um, and then SI joint dysfunction we'll talk about at the end. So this is one of those little uh, slides that just kind of introduced my husband and I. He's it's he's not here today, obviously. He's with our, our little one and a half year old cat. Um, but you know, so what do we know anyway? Uh, we both graduated from the University of Miami, Florida. Um, I graduated in 2012. He graduated in 2013. Um, I have a big background in health and exercise science, and then I became a physical therapist. I have a Pilates based rehabilitation specialist certification that I use a lot with my back pain patients. And Bryce was a scholarship rower at OCU, so local to the community, um, and he has a specialty in dry needling. So if anybody's heard about that, we can talk about that a little bit at the end. Not yeah. me. <laughs> so, you know, and so here we are. All right, so getting to it. Sciatica, when we talk about sciatica, I, see, I would say I hear this term a lot. People will say, oh, my sciatica is acting up, or my sciatica is flared up. And I wanted to start this lecture by just defining what that broad term means. So we use this for any pain that starts in the buttocks and goes down the leg. So talking about the sciatic nerve, so sciatica, sciatic nerve, the sciatic nerve is the longest nerve in the body. So it's going to supply our lower extremities. You've got your right side, you've got your left side. It arises off your spinal nerve roots and then comes down into this big nerve. And it's going to have a large diameter and it's going to run under our piriformis muscle. Okay, so if we're looking at our spine and our sacrum, this bone, this triangular bone in between our pelvics here is our sacrum. And so our piriformis muscle arises there and then it's going to come and it's going to attach to my outer femur bone here. So the sciatic nerve is going to run off the spine underneath the piriformis muscle. So when we're talking about a true sciatica, we're looking at a tightening of the piriformis muscle and it's squeezing the sciatic nerve. So I like analogies a lot. Analogies are, it's kind of my thing. So let's say you had your garden hose at home and it was run across your driveway and the water is running through it. Okay, you got that nice diameter from your hose. You come home and you accidentally park your car tire on the hose. So what's gonna happen to the water first? it's going to get cut off. It's going to stop flowing freely. All right. So what, what would be the easiest solution to solve this problem? Move the car. Move the car. Right. Oh. Exactly. So in the case of a true pure sciatica, we're going to stretch the piriformis muscle to help decompress the sciatic nerve. So that's, that's what a true and pure sciatica is. Now we've got a lot of things, aside from a tightness in the piriformis muscle that can send pain down the legs. We call it a radiculopathy, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a nerve root irritation. So we'll, we'll get into that in just a bit. Here's some statistics on low back pain and sciatica. 31 million Americans experience it at any given time, so it's a pretty large number. It's the second leading cause for missed work right behind upper respiratory infection. Um, and we spend, as Americans, about $50 billion to treat this medically. So imaging, injections, surgery, etc. So you know, it, it can be pretty costly as far as the, the numbers game goes. Um, so three ways that you can address your low back pain just in general. You can ignore it and hope that it goes away. Uh, you can do a quick fix. You can mask the pain without eliminating the root cause, mm -hmm. right? So things to kind of just keep getting you by, but not really addressing what's happening, mm -hmm. or you can handle it. So personally, as a physical therapist, I find option number three to be your best bet. 
So finding out what's causing your back pain and eliminating that root cause is gonna be extremely important. Yeah, sometimes though you, you cannot find a good doctor that will tell you that. That's yep. the problem nowadays. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. So if it's reproducible, it's reducible. So that's why I made you all stand up. Mm -hmm. Can you bend forward? Do you have pain? Does it happen when you go bend backwards, side to side, etc.? So, you know, if we can tell what motion is making it painful, then we can probably get to the bottom of it. That'd be awesome. Yes. So lots of studies. So research based studies, randomized control trials in support of physical therapy being more cost effective than than medical certain types of medical management. So a study of lumbar fusion, this is the surgery, very invasive. They go in and they fuse the bones together versus uh, conservative care. So physical therapy being the conservative care and no operation. Six months follow-up, uh, there was no significant, no significant difference between the surgical population and the conservative care physical therapy population. So that's a very good study showing that, you know, okay, physical therapy can be effective as, it, as surgery. Uh, 2015 study saying patients with low back pain who chose physical therapy and saw it through had lower overall medical costs for that incident of low back pain. So uh, in our own results, this is Sherry. Sherry came in, she had some pain going down her leg all the way to her ankle. After a few sessions, she started feeling better. The numbness and tingling went away and she was able to leave the clinic without any pain. And she had had that pain for quite some time. So, you know, we're, we're real happy to, to work with her and get her feeling better. And then Karen, Karen's a weekend warrior and she liked to kayak and everything. And she had some back pain that was keeping her from doing it. Again, after a few sessions with Bryce, um, she felt better. She was able to go back to her activities pain-free um, and really just, you know, enjoy her weekends and, and, and all the activities. And they still don't have any pain? Sorry? They still don't have any pain As go? far as I know, I haven't wow. heard from them since we, since we discharged them. So, first diagnosis that we're gonna talk about is a herniated nucleus propulsus. Uh, some people call it a bulging disc, a slip disc, etc. So you may have heard the terms for that. Uh, but HNP, herniated nucleus propulsus. So typically these are people who have pain with bending, lifting, twisting, sitting for long periods of time, all right? So um, we already talked HNP, herniated nucleus propulsus. So another analogy, you have a jelly donut, okay? So the discs in your spine, your intervertebral discs are a lot like a jelly donut. You've got the cakey infrastructure on the outside that holds the jelly center on the inside. Now, the herni the disc in the spine, um, so let's say we take our hand and we squish the front of our donut, the jelly is gonna move towards the back of it, all right, and fill up the back of it. But because of the cake outside, it's not just gonna go squirt everywhere. The cake's gonna hold it in, in theory. Mm -hmm. So similarly, in our disc, we have what's called the annulus fibrosis which is the outside and this is looking straight down through the top of our head through our spine this is a that type of view now you've got your annulus fibrosis here which is fibrous connected tissue that holds the nucleus propulsus or the jelly on the inside so when we bend forward we put pressure here and the jelly moves backwards now our nerve roots exit our spinal column here here's our spinal cord spinous process the most posterior portion and then your transverse processes. So when we bend forward and there's a compromise in the infrastructure, the annulus or the cake part of your donut, um, the jelly is just gonna move too far. It's not gonna get stopped and it's gonna impinge on the nerve root. When we have impingement on a nerve root, it's gonna give us local pain and it's gonna send pain straight down the butt and the leg wherever to the foot. We might get some tinglies, pins and needles, et cetera. Um, so that's a bulging disc. Our herniated disc, we have even more compromise to the annulus and the jelly starts to exit the annulus ring. There's another level called a sequestrated disc and that's when the nucleus propulsus breaks off and just kind of floats around and can calcify onto structures, which we, that's gonna be a surgical incident there. So this is often caused by bending and twisting to lift a load. Um, so we get a lot of younger moms who come in and their toddlers behind them and they just kind of rotate, twist and pick them up. And you got this wiggly little 20 plus pound, you know, octopus 
that, and then we'll get a traumatic type of herniated disc there. Um, and this can also be caused by cumulative stress. So think about your desk setup at work. If you're sitting for a long period of time and you're constantly just kind of slumping in the chair or you don't have good lumbar support, that's going to put that constant low level flexion strain on the back of the disc. Okay, and it's going to wear down. So with a disc, it's going to take about six to eight weeks to heal, and that's healing that annulus, letting that annulus become strong again. Um, and then if we if we re-injure, this is typically going to start back at square one, so like week zero, and then starting that six to eight week period over again, because we really need to heal the tissue so it's strong to hold the disc in. So non-conservative treatment options, we've got surgery, they do one called a disectomy where they go in and they take some or all the, the jelly out so that it doesn't squish back. We've got shots, people get cortisone shots or they get an epidural steroidal injection where they go in and they have the procedure um, and that's going to put uh, steroids to help reduce the inflammation and the pain. And then we have medication, so you know you can take your Tylenol, your Advil or you know opioid medication uh, but the second two are really just going to kind of mask the pain and not really treat the root cause and then of course surgery we have all kinds of associated risks with surgery but also with disectomy um, if you have one when you're younger then you have less of that disc space so you're going to have more approximation of the two segments so when we start talking about degenerative disc disease that can kind of play in there um, also, too, I meant to say beforehand, if anybody's uncomfortable with sitting for a long period, feel free to move around and all that. Um, so conservative treatment, no bending, lifting, twisting. With herniated disc, one of the most important things is going to be talking to um, these people with, with the herniated disc about, okay, how do you sleep at night? What does your car look like when you drive to work? How long does it take you to get to work? How long are you sitting there? How long do you sit at your desk for the day? Are you lifting things on a regular basis? How are you doing that? Uh, so that we know that you're having these good biomechanics of the spine and that we're not just re-exacerbating and re-squishing the discs back out into that area. So lifestyle modification is essential here. Um, and then exercise and manual therapy. So we're gonna want to reduce the aggravating factor and then we're gonna wanna stabilize and support the spine for healthier movement. So when I say reduce the aggravating factor, it's kind of like what we were talking about, letting the annulus heal. But then we move forward into how do we let the annulus heal? So one, we're gonna use our body mechanics to not bend, twist, or lift, and that's all at the same time, or combining two of them. And then we also have programs like McKinsey Extension. So when we bend forward, we already spoke about, we bend forward, the disc squishes backwards, right? When we bend backwards, that helps to let the disc move forward. So you can see here in the model, he is prone or face down and then pressing up. Gravity is gonna help all that disc matter to come down as well as the position here. It's gonna send the nucleus propulsus forward or more anterior towards the vertebral bodies and away from the spinal nerve root. So an exercise like this would be something I would recommend. Um, now, just a note of it, a rule of thumb at these things, when I give exercise suggestions, these are for typically what we do with this type of patient population. I'm not, I, I don't typically recommend like, oh, you, like if you say, hey, I have a herniated disc, oh, do this, I would, I would have to evaluate you first, just, so, just a disclaimer. All right, any questions on herniated disc? Okay, so the next one is spinal stenosis or degenerative joint, degenerative disc disease. So people have pain with bending backwards, standing up straight, reaching overhead, walking for long periods of time. We're, this is generally what we're, we're talking about with spinal stenosis or typical things we see with it. So this is degeneration of the spine and it results in a loss of space between the vertebrae. So you've got your vertebral body, you've got your disc, and here we've got a stenotic segment where we've lost some space and we have some rigid edges there and we can see that we have impingement of the neural tissue here. So looking on our spine model, we've got our joints in between each of the vertebrae and the transverse and the spinous process. We've got our facet joints. We've got our little nerve root that comes out there. So if we lose space here, we lose space between the, the area that's allowable for the nerve root to exit. So any space we lose, you get 
this little guy is going to get irritated. So we're six and seven then. Six and seven? Yeah. So there's... there's the hell, six and seven? There's, an, there's yeah. lumbar, there's lumbar one through five, right? So there's... Uh, so one through five? Yep, five, four, three, two, one, and then you've got the sacrum, which is S1. So L5, S1. L5, L4. Oh, okay. I thought my doctor told me, huh. I'm, yep. Wow. There are, there's 12 in the thoracic spine. Oh, But okay. the lumbar spine, there's five. And then okay. S1, sacral one. So, um, so, as we lose that disc space, we get some irritation. All right. And then, um, this could also result in compression of the actual spinal cord if we have degeneration and it starts to narrow. So we often see this in an older adult population and it's caused by normal age-related changes. Uh, this is it's a typical, you know, it's spines become less flexible, less mobile. We lose our disc height because we, lose, you know, we degenerate as we get older. Um, so if you've ever been to the grocery store and you've seen somebody leaning over their cart, it's usually because that position is more comfortable than standing straight up. When we lean over, it opens those joints in the back and gives more relief for the nerve roots. Um, so a lot of times these patients will come in and they'll say, hey, Lauren, I can only walk like 10 feet before I have to sit down because my back pain just starts to hurt more. Um, so that's typically something we'll hear. And then on the bottom there, I put the words neurogenic claudication and that's when, so let's say we have somebody and they're walking and that pain just gets worse and worse and worse and worse that's what we would call that phenomenon is because it just keeps irritating the spine, the spinal nerve roots, and then we get more pain and more pain and more pain, and then they need to sit down. Again, non-conservative treatment options, very similar to before. We've got medication and injections, and then we also have the lumbar fusion. So this is a more invasive spinal surgery. Uh, we're taking two vertebrae, we're taking the disc out, putting a spacer, and we're fusing two of them together. Um, so there, a lot of times people will have this surgery thinking like, oh, I'm going to be better after my surgery. Things are going to be fine. They're going to fix it. But this comes with a very significant lifestyle modification. We, we can't keep doing the body postures and things that we were doing prior to surgery and expect to have the magic results that we're hoping to. And a lot of times we'll see patients, uh, we call it failed back syndrome after they have a lumbar fusion um, and they come in and they're having pain that's the same or even worse than it was before surgery. Um, so we really, really let people know like this comes with a lifestyle change. We have to strengthen the muscles. We have to make sure that we are uh, being as healthy as we can with our back. Um, and then of course there's the associated risks of general anesthesia anytime we go under, and especially as we get older, they, they typically want to operate less um, just because of those risks. So those are, that's really, really all I have to say about the, the lumbar fusion. Conservative treatment. So these backs, we want to keep them uh, healthy, strong, and flexible, right? So a stiff back is, you know, can be an unhealthy, painful back. So we're gonna be doing a lot of stretching, a lot of stabilization and manual therapy to reduce the pain. Um, a good exercise that we can do for lumbar spinal stenosis, nice and easy, just laying in your bed, you know, before you get out of bed, you can hug your knee into your chest. That's going to bring the spine into a flexion. So like, let's say this guy's laying down, pulls his knee into his chest, it's gonna pull his pelvis and it's gonna open up, this is an exaggeration, but it's gonna open up the lumbar spine and that's gonna open up the joints in the back and relax the Im impingement we have on the nerve roots. So that's just one nice little stretch we can do. When I talk about movement and flexibility, I'm talking about not only the spine, but the hips as well. The hips are very important for good lumbar biomechanics. All right, the last, oh, any questions on stenosis? Nope, okay. The last thing we're gonna talk about is SI joint dysfunction. So. For those who have had pain with transitioning, so getting in and out of your car, I hear a lot of, go, going up a big step, uh, getting up from the couch after sitting for a while. These are people who stand up and they kind of have that like, Ugh, and they need to move it out and kind of readjust everything before they can walk normal. Uh, that's typically what we see there. I gave a really good impression because this is one that I uh, 
suffer from from time to time, so I can speak about it with empathy as well. Um, so the SI joint is made up of the ilium and the sacrum. So ilium are the elephant ear looking bones in our pelvis here, and then the sacrum is the triangular bone that we spoke about a little bit earlier when we are talking about the piriformis muscle. Um, so a lot of times SI joint dysfunction, I mean I've seen it in every gender and every age, um, but I would say most commonly, like textbook commonly, this is going to be uh, a younger female um, issue. So especially pregnant breastfeeding mothers are going to have some SI joint dysfunction um, because of the relaxing and just the pressure on the pelvis and all those quick body changes. But you know, we definitely see it amongst a very large, a very large population in, in both genders. Um, so older surgeons and, and you know the old guard would say this joint does not move. This is a fused syndesmotic joint. It does not move. Um, however, you know there's research that would support that yes it does and that's why it hurts. Mm -hmm. So you know whether whether you're for or you're against that, we've got things that can help to reduce the symptoms that you're having back there. Okay. Um, so again, steroids, opioids, cortisone shots, and actually the cortisone shot into the SI joint is, uh, can also be diagnostic because if they inject right into that SI joint and your pain goes away, mm. all right, it was the SI joint, but that doesn't mean that that's gonna fix what was causing the SI joint to be uh, dysfunctional in the first place. So, but it's something good to keep in mind. Um, and now the surgery, so whenever I do this lecture, I sort of like, oh, the surgery's so rare. And then uh, um, we got a call from somebody who was like, oh yeah, yeah, I had that fuse. And so, you know, it does still happen, uh, but it's very uncommon that a surgeon will fuse the SI joint because, um, you know, they have, to, they have to adjust it right before they get on the surgical table and then uh, they go in to fuse it. So if you're, if you're wrong, this person's gonna be pretty miserable for, for the rest of their days. Mm -hmm. So they don't typically do it. So for this uh, diagnosis, conservative treatment options, we are going to stabilize the pelvis and the core. We want to take all the muscles that connect to the pelvis uh, and the hip joint and we want to use them to our advantage to help support that joint. Uh, we're going to use manual therapy too to help make it stay where it's supposed to, we'll say. I don't like, the, I do not like the terms back in place. So we'll say stay where it's supposed to. Uh, an exercise that I really like for this is bridging with a ball squeeze. And a lot of times uh, these patients will be like, oh, it hurts to go all the way up. You're just gonna go into pain free range. You're gonna squeeze your ball in between your knees. You're gonna hold your abdominals in and you're gonna lift your butt just as far as it feels comfortable. If you can get it all the way to the top, cool, that's great. But we're strengthening our glute max and our inner thighs to help support our pelvic, our pelvic uh, anatomy. All right, any questions about SI joint dysfunction? No, that one can be a little bit hairy sometimes, a little bit hard. Uh, okay, so kind of earlier we touched on it. People come in, but Lauren, I tried XYZ, it didn't work. How can you, how can you prove to me that physical therapy is gonna be different and help me? Well, I can't. Uh, I can't promise you or guarantee that it's going to be, but you know, what I can tell you is that Whenever we're treating patients, evaluating patients, we're always using evidence-based practice. So we're taking what the research supports and we're gonna try to, we're gonna use it so that we can make more accurate diagnoses of what's happening to you and give you the best treatment for that diagnosis. So uh, these pictures here uh, are what we call Laslett's cluster. So these are three tests and there's five, three out of five tests are positive. Um, then we can be very certain, we have a good degree of certainty that somebody has SI joint dysfunction versus lumbar issues. You know, and sometimes it could be both and that's fine, um, you know, but just having the good testing that's really supported mm -hmm. and has a good specificity to rule in, um, you know, so that we know exactly what we're looking at and we know exactly how to tackle it. Um, this one's my favorite. I, I think I hear, like over my career, I've heard this more than anything else. Like I had an MRI and I'm doomed. Like my MRI says I'm doomed. And like, well, that's not necessarily the case. And this infographic is really good to look at. So this is a study. Everybody in the study, 100 people were MRI'd. None of them had low back pain. So to be in the study, you couldn't have low back pain for X amount of time um, or you know they, they did not have it. So. 
percentage of the people with disc degeneration or spinal stenosis, 37% of 20 year olds, 80% of 50 year olds, and 98% of 80 year olds, or 96% of 80 year olds all showed positive for disc degeneration on their MRI. Same people, bulging disc or herniated disc, 30% of 20 year olds, 60% of 50 year olds, and 84% of 80 year olds. They all showed positive for that, but none of them had pain, right? So I tell people like, hey, you're not your MRI. You know, we're gonna, it's a very good tool for looking at things and seeing things, but don't get in that mindset of, oh, I've got this herniated disc, so that means I've got this pain that's coming from this disc. I feel like people just really perseverate on it and we just have to look at you as a whole. And be like, all right, well, sure, that's, that's there, but let's, let's do what we can to make you feel better and get you out of that pain mindset and make your body feel good. Uh, the opioid and medication route, so think, I think things are starting to get better here, but for a while, like we, I would say doctors were prescribing these opioids and didn't really know what was gonna happen. Like 20 years ago, we didn't really know, uh, they, they didn't really know about what opioids could do as far as addiction rates, and, and opioid addiction rates continue, continue to increase um, and they were responsible for 33,000 deaths in 2015. So it's a highly addictive thing and physicians are trying to move away from prescribing these just to, just to kind of get out of that, that, that cycle of the opioid crisis. Um, then NSAIDs such as Tylenol and Advil, they can have adverse side effects on the liver and the GI system respectively. Tylenol and acetaminophen on your liver and ibuprofen on your GI uh, and stomach. Um, so especially with long-term use. So we want to to stay away from using those for, for prolonged periods of time. So why physical therapy then? Uh, so here we definitely look at the whole individual. So somebody isn't just their, their diagnosis here. We need to know like, okay, well, you know, if you want to, you know, get up and let's say you have uh, you want to go for a walk and you want to get your exercise and we want you to be able to do that and we want to look at okay well what's going on with your car do you have lumbar support what's what is in your life that is making these things happen and what is it that you would like to do without pain or let's say hey I want to I want to be able to hold my new grandbaby and not have pain every time I try to pick them up you know the the things that are important to people are really important to us so we make a plan where we really figure out what's going on and we're going to give you exercises and things, manual therapy, all of the classic PT to support that, but then also give you education and a plan so you don't just see us forever. We want you to be able to manage it at home. We want you to have the power back to be able to see what's happening and know what to do about it. So, um, so that's why, that's where I stand and why I think physical therapy is really important for anybody who is having this pain. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything? No? Oh, good. Okay. So, um, uh, another thing about the clinic too is we're, we're all one-on-one. -on -one. So when you come in, you're going to be seen by your therapist and they're going to have you for the whole hour or the whole duration of your treatment time uh, because we don't double schedule uh, two patients to, to a therapist. So you do get that quality one-on-one -on -one time. They can, um, they can reassess you as they go. You know, you're just gonna get that nice one-on-one, uh, -on -one, very individualized care. Um, and we do take most major medical insurance. So, you know, as all of that goes, the, I guess the point of this is I don't really have anything to sell you <laughs> at the end. If you feel like you'd be appropriate for PT, you know, we'd be more than happy to take a look at you. Or, you know, if you have any other questions or need any consultation from us, you know, we're, we're more than happy to, to do so. Um, I think that well, how much to, how much is it to come in and do our therapy or whatever? It's going to depend depends on whatever uh, insurance you have, and if you don't have insurance, then we do have a self pay price that we try to keep very affordable. Yeah, because I don't have any insurance. Okay, yeah, well, I, I can talk to you about that uh, in a bit if you'd like. Um, okay, and then that's a really really old picture of <laughs> my baby girl who yeah. has been in this. So, um, that's yeah, nice. that's Catherine. We call her Cat. How old is she? She's uh, about a year and a half now. Very yep. cute. I think my husband was taking her to go feed the ducks. Oh, and actually before I log off of the Facebook, I'm going to see if anybody had any questions. Um, no? All right. Bye, Facebook world. Thanks for logging in.